So first of all, I want to thank you, Anderson, Rosie, and Mickey, for showing up for me. It's great to see all of you guys together on stage. What an unlikely trio. <laughs> but um, I love you all for very specific reasons. Um, thank you. What I love most about all three of you and, um, is that you are all fearless in your own uh, field of work. Uh, you are not afraid to take risks and you all have huge hearts. So it's an honor to have all three of you up here introducing me. Thank you so much. And I'm a little bit pissed off at Ro because she never wants to hook up with me. I don't mean like that. I mean, like, like, just get together with me for a dinner or something. She's always too busy. So we have to have award ceremonies to meet. Yeah. It's true. Um, so also congratulations to Andy Cohen for being, for being Andy, basically. Andy, you're legendary. I can't say why. Uh, yes, for being recognized for the Vito Russo Award. And finally, thank you to Sarah Kate Ellis and Glad for this honor. Oh, there's so much to say. Let's see. Um, well, let's start off with the facts. 2019 is a monumental year for our community. We're commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots, which sparked a revolution and outcry of activism, mobilizing people from all over the country to come together and stand up for love and against brutality, violence, and hatred. Okay, here comes the me part. I sat in front of my computer last night with a Red Bull after midnight writing this speech. I do my best work at night. You understand, Andy. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Why have I always fought for change? That's a hard question to answer. It's like trying to explain the importance of breathing or the need to love. Growing up, I always felt like an outsider, like I didn't fit in. It wasn't because I didn't shave under my armpits. I just didn't fit in, okay? The first gay man I ever met was named Christopher Flynn. He was my ballet teacher in high school and he was the first person that believed in me, that made me feel special as a dancer, as an artist, and as a human being. I know this sounds trivial and superficial, but he was the first man to tell me I was beautiful. He took me to my first gay club in downtown Detroit. I, <laughs> I told my dad I was having a sleepover at a girlfriend's house. <laughs> yep, that got me grounded for the rest of the summer. Um, but that evening changed my life. For the first time, I saw men kissing men, girls dressed like boys, boys wearing hot pants, insane, incredible dancing, and a kind of freedom and joy and happiness that I had never seen before. I finally felt like I was not alone, that it was okay to be different and to not be like everybody else. And that after all, I was not a freak. I felt at home and it gave me hope. Christopher was the one who pushed me to get the hell out of Rochester, Michigan. No offense, Rochester, sorry and go to New York and follow my dreams. And that's exactly what I did. 
But boy, oh boy, I had no idea what was waiting for me. The creativity, the energy, the diversity, the electricity, the danger, the risks people were taking, the lack of inhibitions, the art, the self-expression, the nightlife, the music, the gay community, the AIDS epidemic. The plague that moved in like a black cloud over New York City and in the blink of an eye took out all of my friends. Suddenly, everyone was talking about gay cancer, the disease that gay people deserved. It was on every headline, it was on every news show. I saw people starting to behave differently towards people who were HIV positive or who had AIDS, not wanting to shake their hands or eat chips out of the same bowl or touch the same doorknob. It made me sad, it made me feel sick, it made me want to kick everybody's ass. It made me want to shout from the top of the Empire State Building, what the f is going on? Why are we losing all the beautiful people, all the special ones? Somebody do something fast. And I remember the pandemonium and the fear and people trying all kinds of drugs that didn't work and doing my own drug runs to Mexico for my friends to buy experimental medicines that were supposed to help cure but ended up killing them even faster. And a lot of activist groups were forming but everybody was fighting amongst each other and research was not going fast enough and after I lost my best friend and roommate, Martin Burgoyne, and then Keith Haring, happy birthday Keith, um, I decided to take up the bullhorn and really fight back. I started to do, well, what some people perceive to be outrageous things. I went to St. Vincent's, St. Vincent's Hospital. I heard there was a whole ward of men and women dying of AIDS. When I arrived, I felt like I had entered a concentration camp emaciated bodies in every bed, and all these people who had been abandoned by their families and their friends and their loved ones. I decided to defy the universe and get into every bed and put my arms around as many humans as I could and make them feel loved and human. I came home smelling like shit and vomit and death and defiance. I came home smelling like gratitude. A few weeks later, I was leaving my apartment building on CPW and 64th Street. Don't worry, everybody knows where I live anyways. <laughs> I, I walked out into my courtyard and my courtyard was filled with news crews and paparazzi, the flashes were going off, and microphones were being stuck in my face, and reporters were asking me how it felt to be diagnosed with a HIV, and how it felt to, to have AIDS. And suddenly, everything clicked into place. I realized then and there that if you are going to stick your neck out and fight for the rights of people who are feared or misunderstood or different, you better be ready for the lies, the bullying, the bullshit, the gossip, the hatred, and the abuse. <clears throat> These were dark days for all of us, but I never gave up because it was the gay community that embraced me and gave me life and the courage to be me. So I had to get in the front line, no matter the cost. 
Sometime after that, my beloved ballet teacher, Christopher Flynn, died of AIDS. And somewhere in all of that craziness, I became a creamy smooth pop icon goddess. <laughs> I decided to use my fame to make even more noise, to fight for more research and more money and more awareness and more compassion and provoke and make trouble, because that's what I do best. When I made the film Truth or Dare, I had no idea I was going to. <laughs> Seriously. I had no idea it was going to inspire so many gay men to A, give blowjobs to Evian bottles, <laughs> or B, just have the courage to come out. Yes. And be free and take a stand and say, this is who I am. Like it or not, okay? When I look back and watch that film, I am horrified by my brattiness. <laughs> but I'm also proud that it gave so many people hope. <laughs> the freedom fighting expanded and continued, and so did getting my ass kicked. Fighting for all marginalized people was a duty and an honor I could not turn my back on, nor will I ever. Yes. To quote the great James Baldwin, which you he like beat me to so many punches, by the way, because I worship James Baldwin, but he has kept me going in the darkest of times. And I just want to, there's so many things he says that I want to quote, but we haven't got all night. Because only an artist can tell, and only an artist has told since we have heard of man, what it is like for anyone who gets to this planet to survive it, what it is like to die or to have somebody die, what it is like to fear death, what it is like to fear, what it is like to love, what it is like to be glad. Hymns don't do this. Churches really cannot do it. The trouble is only the artists can do it. The price that he or she has to pay himself, and the price the audience has to pay is willingness to give up everything, because nothing, none of it, belongs to you. So 14 years ago, I heard about an AIDS epidemic in Malawi, a country in sub-Saharan Africa that I'd never heard of before, embarrassingly, a country that had left over one million children orphaned by AIDS. I decided to go there and see what I could do, and it was like history repeating itself. Hospital wards filled with emaciated, dying people laying in hallways and under beds. Abandoning child, abandoned children wandering the streets everywhere, orphanages overflowing. No medicine, no education about what was happening, and no one talking about prevention. Eventually, I made a documentary called I Am Because We Are, wanting to share this journey. Thank you. wanting to share this journey and hoping to raise awareness and inspire others to help me. I started advocating for change in the warm heart of Africa, which is what Malawi is known as. Building schools and orphanages and eventually a pediatric hospital. It is here that I met and adopted four of my six most beautiful children. Remember what that guy used to say, Ro? 
Tom Hanks. There's no crying in baseball, <laughs> right? So that's stopping me from crying right now. I'm just listening to Tom Hanks in the back of my head. Okay. <laughs> to quote a song on my new record called Extreme Occident, life is a circle. Death and loss brought me new life, brought me to life, brought me to love. And so we are back to the beginning of my speech, the importance of love. Because as soon as you really understand what it means to love, you understand what it takes to become a human being. And that is every human's, and that it is every human's duty to fight, to advocate, to do whatever we can and whatever it takes. Madam X is a freedom fighter. <laughs> Thank you very much.